I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Hello, welcome to the Cinema Savvy Movie Podcast. I'm Chris Garner, joined by my co-host George Aldridge, and today we're going to be continuing our Harry Potter month, moving into the third instalment of the franchise with Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, released in 2004, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. Um, a departure from the previous two, uh, Chris Columbus directed the first two films, um, bowed out for this one, so we are moving into almost completely new te- territory with this one. A um, lot of new stuff in this, a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, as always, these reviews are going to be very spoiler-filled. Um, Harry Potter has been out for ages. Everyone's read the book. Everyone's watched the films. So this is going to be sort of like a very informal sit-back discussion about the film, sort of our experiences growing up with it, our memories of it, and the film itself. So, um, yeah, uh, George, where would you like to start off with this thing? We usually start off with memories, don't we? So um, I think we'll start there. Uh, memories on Prisoner of Azkaban. So this is the very different to the first two films, which are full of merchandise and nostalgia. With this one, I remember seeing the cinema. Uh, We went as a family of five, which was the last time us five saw a Harry Potter film together. Um, Mm -hmm. My parents only seen one, two, and three, and I think one of them seen five and six. But so this was the last time we saw it together. I remember distinctly seeing it at the cinema. I remember mainly the scene with the cabins before Hogwarts they got into Hogwarts you know the ones with the Thestrals are actually piloting yeah. them so I can remember that and the only bit of merchandise I actually have is actually in my room at the minute which is the, the Lego night bus um, which is insane because I had so much for the first two films and then I didn't really I hadn't grown out of Lego at this point but I think you mean you spoke before that Star Wars 3 came out a year after this and Star Wars 3 was the film I had the least amount of merchandise mm. for so I don't know whether it was an age thing because I was only 8 when this came out but it was certainly um, a downside, especially as the Lego Harry Potter stuff is currently more valuable than Lego Star Wars stuff. Um, but I'd have loved to have had a bit more, but it's just so expensive to get now. Mm, yeah, and I think I was um, I think I was eleven when this movie came out, and I'm exactly the same with you on this one. Um, in fact, I would say I draw more similarities with my style of watching this film to what you did with Chamber of Secrets. Um, whereas you watched it on a copyright um, with the Chinese subtitles over that one scene, um, I had I saw this on copy actually at my next door neighbours, um, and I don't know why I didn't go and see it at the cinema because it's not like. I had completely dropped off Harry Potter. I think this movie was the point where I started to drift away from it. Um, that being said, I love the third book. I only read the first five books, but um, I read them all before the movie came out. And Prisoner of Azkaban was my favourite book, and I was really looking forward to seeing the movie. I don't know what happened. I don't know what my thought process was, because I loved Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets so much that I'm really confused with myself why I didn't see this one on the big screen. Um I watched it on a copy and I remember seeing it and not being too fond of it and I don't know if that's sort of like had some knock-on effect to my opinions on the movie now because this is actually going to be a really interesting review between me and you and um, me with a popular opinion again this is I think the second highest rated um, Harry Potter film um, but by a lot of fans it is their favourite one Um, it's it's your favourite one as well isn't it I think yeah it's my my favourite film book wise uh, I'm rereading the last one at the minute but at the minute it's my second favourite book after Half of Prince Mm. Um, there's something about it where they just they expand everything so much more and make it dark and more adult but the actual story itself the introduction of some certain characters I just I love this film what they do with it and I mm. think uh, film wise Afonso Crown's got a lot to do with that yeah but like were you talking about the the merchandising and things like that and I'm, I'm completely with you I can't remember aside from the Lego but I mean Lego's always ongoing isn't it that's always a thing that's going to be around but in terms of everything else like action figures I don't remember anything from this movie the only thing I think I had for this film was that I bought the PS2 game of it and that was sort of like a running thing because I had the other two this was the last um, Harry Potter film that I bought the video game for since then I think um, Goblet of Fire onwards the quality of those games really really went down Um, I liked the more free roam aspect of the video games which was really prevalent in this one um, but yeah, I, I just wasn't as immersed immersed in this one as much as I was the other two. And I, that might be down to the marketing, might be down to the tonal switch, I'm not sure. Um, but I think the best word to describe this film in terms of 
most of its aspects in fact especially the visual look the direction um locations and the music is departure um there are some things that carry over but this is almost like it feels like a soft reboot to me in a way like it's still very much part of the franchise don't get me wrong but there's a lot of things that they change appearances of things um the like the geographical location of hogwarts changes um a lot of things involving the aesthetic that just i think that's what kind of rubs me up the wrong way about this film it doesn't feel a lot of people see this as that transitional film which takes it from the columbus style um the whimsy i know there was darkness prevalent in those movies but um really the darkness is at the forefront of this one and i think that's what a lot of people gravitate towards it more but it doesn't feel as smooth of a transition personally to me um but i don't know but we can start talking about um kwan now if you want because you know a lot more about sort of like the the back behind the scenes and stuff that happened with the whole production process yeah so i don't know if i spoke about in the chamber of secrets of you but when chris columbus he obviously signed on to do seven films um and it was halfway through making the second one. David Heyman even said um, we could tell he was stuck in tired and jagged. Yeah. And the behind the scenes stuff was him interviewing him. He just says that like it was just so stressful. I'm supposed in back to back films, and he's been told he's got another five to do. And at the time, they were going to be done yearly. Mm. And he's, I think, it was halfway through filming or making the second film where he said, "You know what? This is going to be the last one." Yeah, he was saying so, that he was missing his kids as well, like he would miss all their years he, of growing up. He used to fly to America every weekend and come back to England on the Sunday night, which is absolutely yeah. insane. Um, but there's a lot of credit for going and doing that because some directors just want to see their kids for a few years. But mm. I can completely understand why he left and he had created the world. And I, I think they said once he announced he was leaving, I think they all sat down and said, okay... We're not going to today the next film, but we're going to change the Harry Potter cycles to an 18-month strategy rather than a 12, um, which they do actually follow through until they get to part one and two, which is obviously a six-month gap between them. Mm -hmm. And then the director search happened, which is very intriguing because you had, um, I was going to say Gilder Lockhart then, (laughs) you had Sir Kenneth Branagh, who was offered it, who I think turned it down, or he was on a shortlist for it. But what happened is that Alfonso Cuaron was in pre-production for Children of Men, and he was offered Prisoner of Azkaban and he took it on and he, he knew he'd do one film because he then went straight back to do Children of Men which obviously, did he win many Oscars for it? I, I actually haven't seen it but um, I haven't checked how many Oscars that movie won but um... It's one of the more recent classics I think you could say um, Yeah, so... really really big cult following on that movie though isn't there? And yeah. actually um, when he was offered the role of this movie I think he was unsure at first because he hadn't seen any of the previous movies and he hadn't read any of the books either and I think it was after reading Prisoner of Azkaban he was like okay this is something I can do um, I know that J.K. Rowling really really enjoyed his previous film he made before Azkaban which I'm gonna is it check what e- that was now EU Mama Tambien it's something e- like yeah. that it was, it, was, it was a Mexican film and it got a very good reception which obviously launched him into a big career if you guys don't know what he's done he's done Gravity, Children of Men um I forgot the other two that you mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a little princess which came out in 95, which I think is probably, although not tonally as consistent with, like, say, Prisoner of Azkaban, it is based on, like, a children's book, and he has, like, had experience working with child actors, so I guess that gave him some credit for helming Harry Potter as well. Yeah, and I think when you look at the film, just in general, they kind of say that the first two, um, Chris Columbus was teaching them how to act as well as directing them, whereas... Afonso Cran came in and he kind of said, you know, I saw them as actors, not children, which mm. is a very distinct working method between them. And he had a very, he's got a very different directorial style to them, um, to Chris Columbus. So he was, I think, more, not hands on with the kids, but he was, what do you see this character doing? So some of the more famous things are basics like you come in with your hair done however you want it to be, like you are a teenager. And I think that's most resembled in Malfoy's haircut change when he went from the the pulled back slick one to mm. just the let it loose. The same with Harry; they just looked like teenagers for the first time in their life. Obviously, at this point, they had hit puberty and stuff, which explains a lot of their appearance and voice changes. But certainly, in terms of where the franchise was going, I think it was the right choice to change some of the tones and how the the kids are gonna you know become these adults. And yeah. there's, there's the famous backstory, which most people know, and in case you don't, when he met Rupert Grint, Emma Watson, Daniel Radcliffe, he said, 
I need you to write me an essay uh, in the point of view of your character and what they've done of their life. And mm. it famously goes, um, and Watson handed in a four-page really neat one as Hermione Granger. Daniel Radcliffe did a kind of scruffy one-page like Harry would do, and Rupert Grint didn't hand it in. Um, and Rupert, he just said, because Ron wouldn't ha- do it, so I won't do it. And it, you, from there, that's the get-go, and you can tell it's so different to what Chris Columbus would have done, but like I said, it's just two very different directors doing a sort of bridge gap of films. Mm. And not to say like Chris Columbus couldn't direct these kids again in this third movie or have that transitional sort of directorial change, but I think it made sense for Chris Columbus to step down and someone to come in like Cron who could sort of like, you know, tutor them and mentor them as they advance into adulthood with their acting. And I'm sure like they had many great experiences working with him on this which they could then develop and take forward into all the future films um but yeah so i liked i like some aspects with that i like that he sort of made them do that task because that really does speak to their characters it's a good chance for them to get to know their characters as well as karan who's you know fresh onto this project um hasn't really been involved with everyone who'd worked on this movie it was a good sense for him to sort of like an icebreaker task almost and i do like the fact that there are moments where they are in their own clothes in fact that's pretty much throughout the entire climax is where they're just wearing their own clothes and it does make it feel more like a kind of university college kind of thing where they do sort of you know allow you to be your own person and i think that was important for this movie especially again because it's sort of going to like harry's identity and all elements like that there are moments where they are in their uniforms um i think it would have looked very strange if they are still all in their uniforms at the end of this movie um especially and- with stuff like hogsmeade coming into it um, yeah it's, it's natural progression i think is the right word for it yeah and i mean all the other future films after this do take from what was started from this movie and do it themselves like even in like order of the phoenix which i watched last night they're in their own clothes uh try was a tournament you've got the yule ball they've got their clothes that they wear for the actual tournament themselves um and i think that kind of all stems from this movie so i do appreciate the movie in that respect um and the tone and everything like that what i don't like and what we can move into talking about now is the change of hogwarts um they filmed a lot of this stuff around scotland i think um they wanted to use more real locations which is completely fine they wanted to abandon most of the sets that they had from the first couple of movies um however if i love continuity in my movies especially big franchise films if a character gets recast i'm always sort of really against it i know they had to do that for gambon and we'll talk about him later on in the review but when you have an established look for hogwarts in two movies and that is what you know as Hogwarts, and that is what is Hogwarts to you. When you take elements like, say, Hagrid's Hut, for example, in the first couple of movies, it was sort of at the end of a flat stretch of um, land right outside the Dark Forest. Um, and that's what we know is what Hagrid's Hut is. When you get to this movie, they have to like go all over highlands and hilllands, and it's like at the very bottom of this slope, and it's not next to the Forbidden Forest anymore. So that stuff kind of it ruins that continuity for me a little bit and it kind of takes me out of the movie because i'm questioning why it's changed um the Wampin willows location for example i'm sure most of this stuff not you know it doesn't bother people but me who likes continuity in films um especially one like a big franchise such as harry potter really does kind of bother me a little bit um that being said i'm kind of torn because i do like the move to real locations and i think that the locations they picked in scotland do really work for Hogwarts and it does look really really nice and that's a look again from this movie that continues into all the other ones um it's just kind of weird I'm not sure why they did it I think it was more sort of like they had the locations they were working with and then realized that oh maybe these won't work with the pre-established geographical design of Hogwarts but it, it does kind of annoy me a little bit you have to kind of as a viewer you have to kind of come up with your own reason as to why they moved everything maybe Dumbledore magically moved Hagrid's hut because he would be teaching third year I don't know the way see this is where me and you spoke before we've both got such different opinions on the changes um I think a lot of it makes sense and I think some of it is partially to do with the fact that the third book came out once pre-production was well under around the first two films the first two films being shot back to back there is no way they can alter any of the Hogwarts design mm. the production designer who I've forgotten his name 
he said in an interview where like he kept changing things every film because he was trying to almost perfect it to himself which from the third film onwards you don't really notice it. the main gap is between the second and third film but I think a lot of it if you look at where Hagrid's hurt is in the first film it's, it's right outside the a courtyard and yeah. it doesn't really make sense given um how close he is to the kids to be teaching there if that makes any sense mm. it makes sense to be nearer towards the forest which the, the third film does go near to but the Whomping Willow stuff I, I think because it gets a backstory in this film which isn't thoroughly explored in the film because again they can't um, due to time but it's planted actually I'll, I'll wait till we talk about Lupin for that but the Whomping Willow change has made sense and again that comes down to the book being released to the pre-production of the first two films but I, I think that some of the changes make a lot of sense and we haven't really spoke about the insets but what um, Alfonso Cuarón said in an interview was that if you look at the first two films every time they go in a room you can, obviously we know it's a set but there was nothing in terms of geographical locations, you can't place where you'd get to there from there no. in Hogwarts no. and one of the things they do really well in this is not necessarily tracking shots but it's very obvious of the design of the school what which room leads to where and vice versa so a lot of that made sense i think that's because if you look at stuff like gravity and children and men he does do a lot of long take stuff so i, I think he's really really tight with sort of uh cinematography making sure he knows what's going to flow into where mm. and you can understand that from his perspective but and I think that change helps as well, um, especially with the plot point later on in the movie with the Marauder's Map. Now, you don't really get a long-lasting look at the map to decipher where every room is, but I do think that maybe that does help, and I agree with that. You do get a better sense of where rooms are in relation to everywhere else. They add new locations in here, like the bridge, which is sort of like continued all the way through and has a very, very big part in the final Harry Potter movie. Um, you have that pendulum, that's sort of like swinging in the main room which again you see in order of the phoenix so there are elements i like of that it's just very it's a very strange viewing experience when you go from one to two straight to this movie it is a very different feel to it there's a whole very different feel to the movie i think there's a very sort of it's medieval or like celtic influence in a lot of the stuff for example like in the outside courtyard you've got almost like stonehenge kind of stones just there and it does give a great like, sort of sense of character to Hogwarts. Um, even in like the music, and we'll touch on the soundtrack later, the music does have like there's a greater sense of like harpsichords and instruments that are used more in like sort of medieval settings and locations and time frames. Um, it's just it's strange. It, that, that's the only sort of like explanation I can give to when I watch this movie. A lot of people love this movie. When I watch it, it feels awkward, it feels unsettling. And maybe that's down to the tonal change as well, and maybe that was the intention, but it doesn't feel like the same place I've spent the last couple of years with with the films. Um, and that's also down to the changes in character design as well. Um, I was reading a bit of the trivia on IMDb before this about Flitwick's character, for example, with um, Warwick Davis playing him, um, is now the choir master. Now, I don't know if that was the original intention. I think on there it says that they... Um, Kron wanted to introduce, introduce the concept of a choir master he wanted that sing-songy element to it to make it feel much like a school and you do have that great song in the soundtrack um, Double Double Toil and Trouble um, and I think later on in the movies when they kept using his character he was then credited as Flitwick but again if you're going from the other two films complete different appearance from Flitwick in the first two with the charms master, the charms teacher Um in Diagon Alley, the role of Tom, um, he was just sort of like an innkeeper in the first movie. He speaks to Hagrid briefly. In this movie, he's a hunchback and is like a completely different creature almost. It's very strange. Um, and the fat lady, um, I think the actress tragically died, though, the one who played her in the first movie. So, again, clearly you can't use her again. Um, but the casting of, um, oh, what's her name? Dawn French. Yeah. Um, really weird and I, I that's one of the elements I hate to the film I hate her character in the film I hate how she played the fat lady um, they couldn't even get an actor that sort of mirrored the tone there was an air of respect and grace to the character from the first movie in the portrait in this she's just played as comic relief and it really doesn't work 
there's a lot of elements like that especially in the character alterations and changes which feel like it's out of continuity from the previous two and i'm i'm sure some people can just watch it and still just you know take it in stride because it's all part of the harry potter franchise all part of the harry potter world but when you do have that set continuity it does bother me slightly and i think that's why i don't hold this film up as high alongside all the other ones in the franchise as many other people do i think with some of the changes the fat lady stuff this would come down to the, the books again is that when they made that first film okay the third book was out but she had no other role whereas in this with the whole serious black incident there's some deleted scenes which they've taken out but with Corona as well what they do in this they if you look at the portraits in the first two films this is every single one you're right they, they move they move like the normal pictures do but in this every single portrait is a an actual piece of footage this is when they introduce mm. the green screens over the front I mean um, they're moving from portrait to portrait in this one aren't they yeah so I think again that comes down to there being s- such a radical difference in the book which they have to try and adapt while trying to keep it as similar as they can to the first two you're right I'm not the biggest fan of the Dawn French stuff I think it's because Vicar Dibley was popular at the time mm. um, and, and also another bit of trivia the uh, the shrunken head in the night bus is voiced by Lenny Henry and at the time those two were married yeah. so I don't know if that had some influence on the casting for either one of those although I do love the, the Lenny Henry aspect um, with the shrunken heads who were oh. also in the Hogshead bar um, which is just oh, this yeah. very random magical creature thing which I kind of like about it but the the changes, I think again, it comes down to the directorial style and what's going to come in the future. I think Chris Columbus he did a great job, but you could not imagine Chris Columbus's Hogwarts during the Battle of Hogwarts. No. Whereas this one, you very much could see that coming by a country mile. So I think when they got when they took that extra gap between two and three, I think they sat down and said, right, we're going to prepare for what happens because the changes that follow the third film in terms of geography, there's I'm struggling to think of any outright obvious ones in my head, let alone ones that are kind of important to the plot. That makes mm. sense? Yeah. But it's just one of the sort of changes that, they, that I think they had to do, and I think by doing it in, in the third film made the most sense because it is the film where it gets dark, where the the plot leading up to all the final four does get mm. very important. Although the second film comes back to it later on with Half of Prince. The Half of Prince wasn't out then, so the producers didn't know that. Neither did the cast or crew. Mm. Um but I, I can understand the change everyone's got different perspectives on it but what it kind of does it silently it doesn't delete the first two films but about the soft reboot when I speak to my friends about it a, a lot of them say that the the first two are the kiddiest of the two and not yeah. everyone I mean I loved it as a kid and I still like them now but if I'm going to sit down and watch one it's very rarely going to be the first two over any of the other five and I oh, think see, yeah see that's where we differ because I always go back to the first two first it's either Deathly Hallows Part 1 or 2 or the first two, which are like complete polar opposites to each other, but oh, that's interesting. I, ju- I just think that's that's the way they work, isn't it? It's, it's like yeah. the whole the prequel-sequel debate to a kid, isn't it? Kids yeah. love the prequels, although it's completely unrelated. It'll be the same Marvel, DC, who's your favourite Spider-Man? The original or the new one? I just think that's, that's the way the cinema goes. It mm. follows a pattern. Yeah. But if we're going to get into the, the main change of this film, um, it is the casting of the recasting sorry of, of Dumbledore um, mm-hmm. with Michael Gambon which we've both said before we've got different opinions of but I think Michael Gambon suits the, the this film and onwards in terms of how the, the tone of the film suit rather than I forgot his name who perfectly suited the first two. Oh Richard Harris Yeah that's the one. Yeah um, to me recasting Dumbledore of what Richard Harris brought to the role was an impossible task from the get go I really don't think you could capture what he managed to bring to that and there were a few names thrown around I know the part was offered to Ian McKellen um, but you know he says that I've already played one legend with Gandalf and doing two would just be impossible also he thought it would be inappropriate to take the role after Richard Harris considering him and Richard Harris had a bit of a feud and I think um, Harris had called him out as being a bad actor or something like that which is kind of amusing I didn't know they had that whole rivalry um, and with Gambon I remember not liking him at the time it felt going from Chamber of Secrets especially the end of Chamber of Secrets to this one um, even the costume change as well very very different design just complete aesthetic change to what Dumbledore looks like but after we spoke I think it was in our last review where we talked about that um, 
I am coming around to more your way of thinking with this one, where Richard Harris's Dumbledore would not have suited the tone that Dumbledore goes through in the books. And I think it was... It sounds awful, because, I mean, he didn't intend when he he was going to die, but it made sense to do it from, like, this third movie, where the books do start getting darker. Um, I mean, going back, like, I wouldn't change it. Like, I wouldn't special edition the original films and oh, add Gambon into no, it. No, 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 no. Because both, of, both actors, both Richard Harris and Gambon, did bring something very different to the roles. Um, I just prefer the personality type and the style of Dumbledore from the first two films... But as you said, it does make sense for the way that his character sort of evolves throughout the later books, especially in like Half-Blood Prince and Deathly Hallows. It makes sense to have Gambon because he does have that darker, more sinister edge to him, I think, than Richard Harris did. I think I compared Richard Harris to sort of like a lovable granddad who you could sit and like listen to stories from all the time. Um, But Gambon definitely does have that darkness and that ulterior motive which we learn about later on in the films, but that's for a future review. Yeah, and I think with the two Dumbledores, they're so stylistically perfect to their to their world. Um, mm. I could not imagine the the grey, not doom and gloom of Gambon, but I you can't put Gambon's Dumbledore in the first two films, and you can't put Harris's Dumbledore in the later films, mm. especially Order of the Phoenix. When I watched last night, like yeah, I can't imagine I mean, Harris dueling. I was gonna. I think I said last time that like, I couldn't imagine him picking up a wand at alone doing a spell with it, but. Went there before though. You have the mirror of a rise scene, which I couldn't imagine Michael Gambon talking to Harry in such a, a cool manner. And with, with Dumbledore, he makes such quirky comments like, "What do you see in the mirror?" And it's like, "I see socks." Yeah. And that's that's such like a Dumbledore line in the books. But that bit suits Gam not Gambon. Sorry, that bit suits Richard Harris so well. Whereas, in the third book, more so than the others, Michael Gambon does try a few of the quirkier lines, which. They they work, but not as well as they not did under well, Harris, yeah. and I think mm. that's down to the tone of it rather than the delivery. But everything from the costumes to the, to the they've still got half spectacle glasses, but it's so much more obvious in Michael Gamb uh, not Gambons. Why do I keep getting the two Gambons <laughs> mixed up in Harris? I get confused myself. Yeah, but it, it, it's just one of the changes that it was unfortunately it had to happen. But at least when they did it, they they nailed it for what was to come. Yeah, whether or not J.K. Rowling, I'm sure she had a lot of say in it but I'm sure she knew where that character was heading and who they needed for it. Mm. But... And even Gambon in his performance, like, I don't know if you noticed this, and I'm not quite sure why he did it. Um, he does speak with a very Irish. slight Irish accent. Yeah. And obviously Richard Harris was an Irish actor, um, although he never really had a very obvious accent, even in the first two Harry Potter films. In fact, you know, you wouldn't even notice it barely. Um, so it was a bit strange how Michael Gambon decided to do that and it's not all the time like he kind of segues in and out of it and I don't know if he just completely abandons that as he gets you know later on in the series um, very very weird weird acting style I think for that But um... although I will say Michael Gambon has one of the funniest bloopers of the Harry Potter series I don't know if you're aware in this... oh, I haven't seen any of the bloopers there's this brilliant one in the third film when he's talking to Snape of Harry in the sleeping bag on the floor mm. after the first black attack M- uh, Michael Gambon has a controller for a fart machine which they put in Harry's <laughs> sleeping bag because apparently at the time Daniel Radcliffe was in a tent and he fancied the girl that whoever the extra was that was sat next to him mm. Yeah. and during this scene you can just see Alan Rickman and Michael Gambon like pressing this button every few seconds and Daniel Radcliffe was like really like red face and they're just there absolutely like pissing themselves <laughs> it's just one of the most random funny things I've, I saw in so long oh that's brilliant um, and it's, it's good to know that they had that humour off camera as well like I, I, in a film that's really serious and dark and macabre like you don't expect them to have that much fun behind the scenes but that's cool as I said I haven't seen any of the bloopers I'll have to go back and watch them at some point I'm looking at our plan now you also say that Trelawney changes oh, was she in the first two movies or do you mean that no, she was just added into this I, film I just because everything just changes I just meant Trelawney was introduced yeah uh, okay well I guess we could talk about Trelawney and then we'll move into some of the other performances because I think one of the strengths of this movie is in its performances of its supporting cast um Emma Thompson um, is one of my favourite actresses. She's perfect. She's worked a lot. She, you know, she's done a lot of Shakespeare before. 
And this is a very, very different role for her. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen her do a role like Trelawney before. She's very ditzy. She's she's very sweet, though, and that, especially when we get to, like, Order of the Phoenix, when there's that heartbreaking moment. We'll get to that in that where Umbridge um, sacks her and almost goes to, like, banish her from the grounds. She's a very likeable character, and uh, sort of, like, her personality type in this, you could definitely see suits the character. Um, I guess you could go really overly mystic with the character, but I like the humour she brings to it. And there's a lot of, there's a deleted scene from Order of the Phoenix where she's eating food and the camera just kind of like sets on her for like two minutes. And it's fantastic, the character performance she brings to this movie. And she does have a darker moments as well, where she goes into like the weird uh, trippy visions in there and she talks in a demonic voice, but... I think we, me, you and Tate were talking one time, weren't we? We were saying if Harry Potter ever got a reboot or it was readapted, who would we cast as all these characters? And f- for pretty much everyone in the entire cast, we couldn't think of anyone. Um, and Trelawney, I have no idea. I just love Emma Thompson. What she brought to the role was great. I, I wish I could have seen more of her in all honesty, like her performance, her character sort of goes away for most of the film. She only crops up in a couple of scenes. Um, I guess it makes sense because she's not, she's clearly not always centered on the plot, but um, I really like seeing her in this movie and I like the classroom um, scenes you get in each of the movies with the new teachers. Yeah. And she's, she's not, What's the word? She's so good in it. I mean, she's such a nutcase. When I think of Emma Thompson, I think of Nanny McPhee. And I yeah. I remember finding out that she was Trelawney, and I was there like, no way. Mm. And it's just the, the gigantic Maz Kanata glasses on her, <laughs> stuff like that. She's so funny, but it's even when she's introduced the the way that she holds her voice so high and, you know, she's looking to the abyss. And <laughs> in, in the books, it's so clear she's, she's such a fraud and she yeah. plays it so well. But then you do get that terrifying moment. She does make a a proper prophecy for once, mm. and you know she, her voice has gone wary. Her eyes are kind of I don't know if they're rolled back, but her eyes are going all over the place. Mm. And she now again that's down to Emma Thomas. It's just so not Emma Thomas. Um, Thompson. Thompson. I was thinking of Nolan's wife then. Yeah. Um, it's just so well done, and she can alternate the click of a finger between it, and I think that's so important to casting this character. I mean, she's got minor roles in the fifth one, which I'm happy they did keep her in. The sixth one, she's got a really important scene, which they cut, but we'll discuss that during uh, the Half of Prince review. But mm. she's such a welcome addition to it, and it suits it so well. And um, I love the rivalry between her and Hermione in it as well, because Hermione's always been a goody two-shoes, um, even in like Snape's class in the first one. She always wants to try and be teacher's pet, but in this one, she just does not care at all about divination. And there's that brilliant bit where Trelawney's like, it's like she's looking at Hermione's hand and she goes, oh no, you see it there. You know, your soul is as dry as the page pages of the books you desperately cleave or something like that. Um, I, I love it because it's a side of Hermione we haven't seen before. And it also obviously carries on the, the, the time turner which is introduced in this movie, which is probably the biggest plot hole in the entire franchise. Um, nope. I guess we could talk about that later. Yeah, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a page in the book that clears up why they never use that again in later installments but uh, I'll be able to go for that later on with you it's, yeah. it's it's a weird one but it's you know adding in time travel to a fantasy franchise is always gonna have have an effect especially when they do a, a play around it after the mm. film's finished too um, I yeah. think we need to talk about Mooney and Padfoot right now because I talked about performances <laughs> Uh, David Thewlis as Lupin and Gary Oldman as Sirius Black are two of the finest actors working today i love those actors so much i couldn't think of better actors to play these characters when i read prisoner of azkaban the reason it's my favorite is entirely down to those two characters and the the chemistry sort of between them how they play the roles um ha- lupin scenes with harry and how he's guiding him and he's teaching him the patronus charm there's that moment where they're on the bridge and it's a really really nice character moment and the history that's sort of brought about with these characters where they talk about that they were best friends with james potter we get an insight into that which is like the first time in this entire franchise where we get a sense of what james was like at hogwarts because you kind of forget about that and it's nice that they bought into this every single scene with these two guys you are just glued to the screen um they're perfect and it kind of makes especially with lupin i mean sirius does still get more to do later on in the franchise um but lupin i really wanted to see more of his character after this movie and it never quite achieves the heights that he did in this film um 
but that's I can see that being the reason why a lot of people like this movie over all the other ones. And we'll get to music later, but um, I think it's a window to the past, which is yeah. sort of the theme that's played during these scenes. It just really, really ev- elevates them so much to more than you know the sum of their parts. But I'd say those two performances really just sort of bring this movie above and beyond what it is. Yeah, and if I go into Lupin first, I remember not as I saw it, but he was evidently the, my favorite dark arts teacher. Yeah, as in who knows it? Obviously, there's Gilderoy, but in terms of actual character, Lu- Lupin's this lovable one with his, you know, his dark secret, which we do find out, which I do love. Mm. And it's this tragic shame of that they finally get the teacher they deserve, and again, they can only have him for one year. But it's when you do get the backstory with James and Lily. That it adds so much more, and especially when Sirius comes into the fold, Peter Pettigrew. <laughs> then you learn a lot more about Snape when he was at school with them, and it's 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 almost this not another world, but it expands so much more because all you've ever heard at this point of the films is your mom and dad died, uh, mm. Voldemort killed them, now you're a wizard. That's essentially what the films are at this point. But now you get a bit of backstory, and it is right because you forget James and Lily were at school, and they're such welcome additions and. With Lupin as the teacher, you know, he's just this really like nice guy, and he knows what he's doing. He's doing practical lessons for the first time we see in these films, especially with the bogger, and he's got such a personal relationship with Harry. They've got such a good dynamic between Daniel Radcliffe and David Hewlett as well. Mm. And you're right, you do want to see more because there's a lot more they could have shown, and they mm. obviously due to time restraints they couldn't. Even in the future books, they cut a lot of scenes, which is a massive shame they didn't show. And ultimately, uh, none of the guys make it out alive. Yeah. And I mean, like, I haven't read the last couple of Harry Potter books. It's been years since I've read the other ones, literally read them before the movies came out. I'm going back through them now, but I'm aware of some of the history with Lupin, especially regarding Deathly Hallows and the stuff they cut out there. And it's a real shame because that was some great character stuff, which they could have sort of like brought an emotionally fitting conclusion to his character, I think. Um, but unlike we, we talked to, um, I think it was in the last review, sort of, um, the curse of the defense against the dark arts teacher and how they've never had one that's lasted for more than a year. And that's clearly the case with this one, but it is different because he's not a despicable character. He's not, he's a, he's a tragic character. Like this werewolf thing is a curse he has to live with. And I remember reading the book and it, it's brought into the film as well. The moment where he voluntarily resigns and he's leaving and he's packing his stuff up, I remember being absolutely gutted when I read that book because I connected so much to his character. I really liked his character. And it was such a... Because it's a teacher that you wanted to see carry on into all the other ones. You wanted him to be a part of Harry's life, of the Hogwarts life. And when he leaves at the end, it is really emotional, but it does carry on that the whole curse thing, I guess. And I mean, we need to talk Gary Oldman. Um, one of the most versatile actors, I think, of all time. I mean, all you look at all the roles that this guy's played. Um, more recently with like Commissioner Gordon in the Dark Knight trilogy, and then you go to him in this. It's complete night and day. He disappears into this role, and again, this was another one of those roles like Emma Thompson. I'm sure, like a lot of the other actors in it, where you know they hadn't read the books, they maybe hadn't watched the films, but uh, like their kids or whoever maybe pressured them into it, or if they were kids, they thought, yeah, I'll do this kids movie. Um, but you wouldn't know, like, he he knows the character so well, he plays it so well. Uh, we were quoting, like, a week ago, weren't we? We were quoting some of the lines in probably my favourite scene of the entire film, which is the exchange of dialogue between Lupin, um, Sirius, Wormtongue, not Wormtongue, that's um, Lord of the Rings, Wormtail, and when Snape comes into it. And it's almost like you're watching a stage play. Like, it's perfect, the back and forth between them all, the intensity you brought to it. Um, I did my waiting, 12 years of it in Azkaban. Um, All that stuff, they're just, they're all great. And we talk about Alan Rickman as well, who's just phenomenal in all of these movies. Um, Again, I would say this is another one of the films where he comes to the forefront. He has that humorous time where he's like teaching the class where he gets he gets a taster of what it's like to be defense against the dark arts teacher when he takes over from Lupin when he's recovering after his werewolf incident um but then when he comes into it into the conversation as well in the shrieking shack um it's just a really good dynamic between just a group of phenomenal actors and it's really nice to see them all working off each other and that's the thing with that scene you've kind of got they've spoken before Dan Emma and Rupert who are 
they're just in the corner and they're just almost mesmerised they always say by how those four were working off each other mm. and it's, it's great but with the whole of the serious black stuff I never noticed this was Gary Oldman until years after I saw this film I think it was probably around the time of uh, Dark Knight and I was like wait Commissioner Gordon's serious black and I was so shocked and at that point that's when I started getting into film and Gary Oldman he's always been in my top 10 favourite actors everything he does is worth watching the way he transitions himself on screen and he's I don't know if you've seen an image that's come out recently he's playing Winston Churchill uh, in a biopic that comes out at the end of next year which I saw the article I never clicked on it is that him? is yep. that Gary Oldman under the mic? Oh, Jesus and that should be his Oscar he is far more worthy of one than Leonardo DiCaprio mm. and I will say that, and I've said that for years and as Sirius Black you know Lupin is a tragic character Sirius Black's the tragic hero he should and she should have grown up with Harry as his godson mm. but instead he spent 12 years in Azkaban and it's such a tragic story especially given what happens in the future films and there's that moment where he's kind of looking into the lights and I'm jumping the barrel here but yeah. here's going about what he'd give to walk through here as a free man and then you know just tragedy strikes with the full moon and he's never going to get that chance and mm. it's just such a brilliant character they've written because it's so from the build up of the get go of him in the newspaper with the classic where's this wizard the first ever prisoner to escape from Azkaban you know Stan Shrimp like he's a murderer and all this stuff you think here's a really 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 obvious villain and the way these films have gone they have had stereotypical villains before and then you find out he's he's not the villain at all. He's you know, he he's a good guy that's ha- had a bad time, mm. and you want to see so much more of him. And every time the the build up, he was in the castle with the fat lady. That stuff works well. Harry seeing him at the start with the Animagus. Unfortunately, they cut out the Animagus storylines, which is a shame of the Marauders map. There's so much brilliant backstory there, which makes sense to the Whomping Willow and stuff. But I just I just love how they work off each other on the screen. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up that scene as well where you're talking about when um you know he looks up into the stars. That's actually one of my favourite moments in all the Harry Potter movies. Um and the music as well, we'll get onto that later, as I said, with John Williams. Um I think the score was actually nominated for an Academy Award with this one. Um yeah, they all play it so well, and you know he's trying to escape the fate of the Dementors Kiss, which I guess brings us on to the Dementors, which are a new addition into this. Um, almost like the Ring Wraiths from Lord of the Rings, and I guess we could talk about practical effects while I'm on this as well, because Cron really wanted to push for as many practical effects as possible. He wanted to use puppets, he wanted to use as m- many real things as possible, and I mean, I'm a broken record on this, so I'm not going to go into it, but I really appreciate directors that do that. If you can do it with practical, do it with practical, and we see that in the movie with the um, the book for Hagrid's class. Um, I don't know what it's called, but the thing that like bites, you have to stroke the spine to open it. There are a lot of practical things in the movie and he did want to make the de- um, the Dementors uh, all done with puppets and animatronics um, however I think they did test it didn't they they tried them underwater to kind of get the fluidity of the cloak right and the movements right however they thought that it would be completely impractical to do them with real effects so they did move to CGI but I like how it was a last resort and I haven't got uh, anything against CGI Dementors um, they clearly tried it it didn't work but they did use the whole underwater puppet thing as a reference for when they get it into the CGI model for when they do the movements on it and even things like um, Buckbeak as well I know you were telling me about that when they were shooting things on set with that it was a real puppet they made which they then CGI'd over Um, it just gives that the actors a a frame of reference and they can suspend their disbelief better when they have something to work against rather than just seeing something that either isn't there or just like a green saddle or something and just saying like oh pretend it's a creature if you have something there that sort of resembles it it just makes so much more difference and i think the blend of cgi um in this movie is really good and i think the actors um reacting to it like the werewolf scene at the end really completely works i don't know if they had something for the actors to refer to in that but it it seems like they did and i think that the visual effects in this movie were nominated for an oscar as well um didn't win clearly on on the soundtrack or this but um it's good to see that it got a nomination yeah and going back to the buckbeak stuff i was so shocked when i found out because Mm. it was only recently I know they had a Buckbeak at the studio tour, but I thought that was just a generic one they might have made for the hell of it. Whereas actually, there's a completely robotic one which would move with the actors and stuff, which must have made it a lot easier. I mean, 
this is only their third film for most of them. They're all kids. They've really grown up on film sets. And you could not tell with Daniel Radcliffe because Dobby's so small and stuff, but it must have been so hard just to look at the floor and that's where the character was. Whereas in this, it was, here he is, he's moving his head forward to you, so react to it. And I think that's Karan making life easier for them. But then it also makes his job easier for the CGI artists who mm. don't have to, you know, do that. But there's these stories where he spent months and months not altering Buck Beak's design, but because he loved the process, he would change a feather here and there to make him look more wild and unique mm. to himself. And it made it easier, but again, the dementors of the, the, the pool stuff, they actually created a set for the frozen lake. They froze a tank of water and they did something. It wasn't CGI, the freeze effect. I think that was real. Whether they did a time lapse or they mm. created a device to sort of move the, the water in itself, it's absolutely incredible. And again, it makes it easier for people to work off and it, it looks so much better. It doesn't age as bad either. I mean, if you look at the CGI of the first two films, granted, it's done it for a lot of these now, but th some of it doesn't age well, especially the Quidditch matches, whereas in this, because you can see it's so much more practical, it does age well. Yeah. And it looks nicer as well, and it gives a better story to it, but there's such key sort of concepts and characters in this third one. I mean, the Dementors come back in the fifth and seventh films. Obviously, Lupin and Black come back for a few times, so really, you've got a sequence that, that will keep coming back, whereas in Chamber of Secrets the only thing that came back was young Tom Riddle obviously they didn't know that at the time so they couldn't cast someone to not age across 10 years it's impossible the Chamber of Secrets they didn't know was going to come back but they nailed the return of that set and stuff mm. so it's just one of those moments where it's just appreciating everything they put into this third film to do it for the future but it just gives it so much more uh, sort of credibility I think and even the little things like Hogsmeade which is a practical set Mm. I just want to say one last thing on the Dementor. I mean, that opening scene where it's first revealed, it's just like a horror movie. It, it's awesome, like the pace of that, the music in it, um, when everything's frozen. And I think the shot that was used in a lot of the trailers, we talked about the one from um, Chamber of Secrets, it was the mostly hand, focused on the, the dueling club. Yeah, it's the, the hand yeah. that sort of like force pulls the door towards it. Um, the shadow and it's in a the great background. shot. It's a great shot. It's a great reveal because these are new to the franchise. This is... Um, a new thing that Harry, Ron and Hermione are witnessing and you are almost like you're in the cabin with them like I think it's a fixed camera shot when you see the shadow sort of like moving past the door pulling the door towards it and it, it is terrifying when you watch it it is really well done and I know in a sort of like what if universe but I think that Guillermo del Toro was originally approached to direct this movie as well um, he said I can't remember the exact quote but he says that he felt that the book was too happy too bright that it wouldn't work for his tone how wrong he was considering all the creature designs in this movie and the dark tone that it actually is so clearly he didn't read very closely along the book um that would be a fun what if and i could i could honestly see him doing a film like this especially with all the practical effects kind of similar to Quran. um because he's mates with Quran as well yeah um, yeah him in Uritu and Quran are, are quite close i've read i think they call them the three amigos I don't, know that, <laughs> I don't know if that counts as a racist thing or if that's kind of like their equivalent of the brat pack yeah but it would have been very interesting to see you know his take on it mm. especially given the design he would have had with the creatures um but I just, I just love, I love how they do it. I remember the Dementors on. Do you remember News Round? Most people in America won't know this. Yeah. I just remember seeing a clip of it on News Round of the Dementors hand over the door, and that was a key point of the marketing because the Dementors they are scary. I mean, they suck the soul from you, and what I love is the 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 effect of it because in the book it just says like, they suck your soul. There's no description of how it looks very normal, whereas yeah. in this they've got to show that something's happening. So. It's it's a weird effect. It's like they're pulling their faces off, and it's, it's like a motion blur, isn't it? Almost. Yeah, and it, it's so unique to these films as well. I couldn't imagine anything else doing it without saying, "Hey, that's the Dementor effect." Yeah, especially when you get it with Dudley in the fifth film. Um, but I just like everything he introduced in this. The Dementors get most of my favourite shots in this one. I mean, there was that one I talked about in the train cabin. There's one where I think it's a, just like a scene transition where you see one brush past like a flower. Yeah, and, and the flower it just, just kills withers the flower. and freezes. And that's a great sort of transition. I mean, me and you spoke before we recorded that they said the screenwriter struggled making going from season to season because in the books they'll just say like winter past, whereas in this they've got to show it. And in this you get, I think you get a really smart one shot with a bird that goes into the Whomping Willow at the end of it, which mm. is quite funny in itself. But then you do get that demented one, and especially with John Williams' music over the top. Yeah, 
And um, I, I do question how effective of guards these people are. I mean, just watching Order of the Phoenix last night when Bellatrix is broken out of Azkaban, she just kind of stands there and cackles and none of the Dementors are doing anything about it. And they um, do kind of just like randomly attack Harry Potter and I'm not sure why when they're after Sirius Black and I think it says that they were searching the train for Sirius Black. Well, clearly he's not on the train and Harry Potter was just a student there. I don't know if they subconsciously know that he's tied to him somehow or they sense darkness within him or something, but they just randomly attack this poor kid. They're the most like ineffective prison guards I've ever seen. They're just like the complete dicks to this guy. It could be that. If I talk again about the books, I feel really weird saying it. It's like when you do the Game of Thrones yeah. reviews. Um, it's, such, it's so different being in this seat. Mm. Um he's the first ever person to escape from Azkaban and they go into detail again the book doesn't show it in this great monologue where he says you know I, I never fell like to the Dementors psychologically because I always knew I was innocent because they feed off the the, the sort of horrors he's already had his if that makes any sense mm-hmm. the way that Black escapes which I would have loved to have seen was he got so thin that he could transform into the animagus of the dog because Dementors are blind I don't know if they made that film that clear mm. in the film. But no, they, they don't really. They, they sense fear, if you know what I mean. Mm. And he managed to get past them being his, an Animagus because he's unregistered. The uh, the Marauders are all unregistered Animagus, which is why Peter Pettigrew is a scabbers. Um, and it's this kind of cool thing, which is why James is the stag, which is Harry's Patronus as well. There's so much that they could have explored. It gives more history to the Marauders as well, especially to Harry and his dad, Lupin, Sirius. And it, it makes the Dementors far more intimidating. They've always been servants of Voldemort. So in the fifth film, Dumbledore's made clear that you need to get the Dementors. He says it at the end of the fourth book. Dumbledore tells Fudge, you know, get the Dementors away from Azkaban, go back to using the guards you used to do. Fudge has none of it and obviously Voldemort rises because he's so evil he's such like a Dementor they choose to work for him which is mm. why they kind of escape and they end up working for them in the end oh right see all it's, this it's, history it's, that's it's, not it's so movies. not clear and it, it, it's yeah. such a shame because I know I see you can add it here and there if they could let the Chamber of Secrets be 2 hours 40 which you're right is very long but for the shortest book to be 2 hours 40 and all the big ones 20-30 minutes shorter Obviously, I know it's strict on production costs and minutes and lengths, but there's nothing wrong with going four or five minutes over. Mm. And, and I don't know if that's a Warner Brothers thing as well, because I'm not going to harp on it, but there was this whole hullabaloo with the final Hobbit movie. Um, it was the shortest one at two and a half hours. Even the extended cut, there's a lot of scenes that didn't get made into it, and a lot of people think that's down to Warner Brothers either wanting more cinema releases of it, and like the times, we've talked about that with a lot of films, sort of like cinema schedule so they can get more money. Um, or maybe they just think it's like an attention span thing. I really don't know, but I'm sure that no Harry Potter fan would object to... 10 or 15 minutes extra in their movies if it helps flesh out the world more and helps especially casual viewers like me understand it more and I mean all these ins and outs which seem to flesh out the story more and make it make more sense um, but we're talking about new things as well and I know we're coming up to an hour almost so we'll move on through it but Hogsmeade big new addition to this movie the whole concept how Hogwarts takes their students out on these trips to the neighbouring village of Hogsmeade um, you need a written um, letter of acceptance of um, from like a parent or guardian um, and Harry's not allowed to go there I love the design of Hogsmeade and I really wish we'd have got more time there in the movie again we talk about all the extra time we get the Shrieking Shack we see that um but like the tavern and everything else, I remember in the book you get completely immersed in this village. And I know that's a book thing where a book has a better idea of fleshing things out and has more pages. It has more time to dedicate to that kind of thing. Um, but from what we see with it, I really like it. It's completely in keeping with the look of, not the look of Hogwarts, but it, it fits in the same world as that, if you know what I mean. You can tell that it is a neighbouring village to it. Um and I love it, and I was reading about the behind the scenes as well, and um, the Honeyduke sweet shop was actually a set dressing from Flourish and Blots, and yeah. which in turn was a set dressing from Ollivander's one shop. Um, I never knew that, but it shows that they are, you know, they're taking their same sets and reworking them, and it does feel like a different place. Again, I would have liked to have seen more of it, I would have liked to have got a greater sense of this place, but um, it is kind of centred on plot where Harry does overhear that Sirius Black is his godfather, so... I'm not completely opposed to that. I think more scenes may have slowed the running time down, but it's just that case of, like the Lord of the Rings movies, I love getting lost in this fantasy world and seeing 
all the things that are to do with it. Yeah, and it gives you so much more. I mean, it's the first time, I think I said this before, that every location has been the Dursleys, Hogwarts, or Diagon Alley, and you need to expand. And I think J.K. Rowling said that, given what's to come from the later films, Harry can't find everything out about Voldemort, about his life at school. Mm. He has to take it elsewhere. So being in places like the Hogshead, which comes into Order of the Phoenix, and the later films of Aberforth Dumbledore as well, it gives meaning to it and it is a very sly way of sort of writing it because he needs to learn this stuff out mm. and in the book it's Hagrid's in the scene where Harry finds out about Sirius and Hag- Hagrid didn't know that Sirius was responsible he's there like he gave me his motorbike he was already at the scene of the crime after James and Lily died and there's this great stuff and I'm happy they adapted so much but again the testament comes down to JK who said okay I'm not going to have the scene at Hogwarts it has to be here for this reason Mm. And it makes sense because, like what you said earlier, they're not in their robes the whole film. They're at a boarding school and they do get weekends off. And what are they going to do with their spare time? They need somewhere to go. And it's this great addition. And there's always that meme of it's like Harry Potter is like rich, uh, the famous one, all this, loads of money. He's like stole a lollipop from Neville Longbottom, the kid who gets bullied, who's bottom of the class, and stuff like that. So it's it's got these great moments and you want to spend more time there, but it's such a unique design. It kind of feels like Diagon Alley, but near Hogwarts. Hogwarts. It sounds so simple, but it suits the world and it is very differentiated from the previous ones. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, sort of differentiating from the previous ones, I guess we should talk about the the soundtrack now. John Williams. Yeah. Uh, John Williams' final Harry Potter score. I know that I think he was asked to come back for at least the last one, uh, but scheduling conflicts with all the other countless scores he's done, he just he couldn't fit them in. Um, which is a real shame because I liked, and I, I mean, I've talked about this with you off recording at nauseam about the whole continuing themes from the earlier movies to get a greater sense of character, especially Voldemort's theme. Uh, It's not used in this movie, but that makes sense because Voldemort isn't in this film. Um, But even this soundtrack feels like a departure from the other two. It really doesn't use as many of the older themes as Chamber of Secrets did, and I don't know... I mean, reading about behind the scenes when we did the Chamber of Secrets review, the whole thing how um, he didn't have much time, he had to have help constructing that score, Um, he came up with some new themes and then someone had to come in and kind of bring in the old ones and work it together. I'm wondering if he had the full time, would the Chamber of Secrets score have been completely different or would that have had some carryover because you did have the Chris Columbus link between those two films. This one with a new director, a new aesthetic and kind of a new tone to it, I'm wondering if that was the reason why he did change up the soundtrack. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't like this soundtrack as much as the previous two. I think Chamber of Secrets is probably the strongest score out of all of them. Um, But there are some great songs on this. Window to the Past, for example... Um, which is kind of the main theme throughout the entire film. Um, there's also like a serious black harpsichord motif that's used in it and the time turner. Uh, Double Trouble, as you said, is probably one of the major songs of the film. So there are some good ones in there. I think that it is be- because it is almost feel like completely divorced from the other two. That's why I don't gravitate towards this soundtrack as much, but you do still get your beautiful moments. As I said, Window to the Past is probably my favourite song on the album. Um it's just a very different feel and because it is a different feel it makes me curious as to what the rest of john williams's soundtracks would have been like if he had have continued it see i really like the soundtrack i mean when we did the battle of the brackets for a great soundtrack i was debating the fifth film or the third film Mm. and i love this one most people prefer this obviously it had the oscar nomination on its side as well but there are some great songs especially when there's the saving but beak one yeah i forgot about Um, that's a great one I love the the werewolf scene. There's some truly great soundtrack moments. Even Aunt Marge's Aunt Marge, Aunt Marge's waltz. <laughs> that's so reminiscent. And what I said before is that he he kind of he doesn't disown Hedwig's theme, but it's not really a part of it. And I'm happy that John Williams did that rather than the other directors because that can get criticised so much. But the fact that he himself chose to get rid of a part of it meant it was probably a lot easier for them to do it as well. Yeah, but it's just again the styles of the film as it does get darker Hedwig's theme doesn't it's still great to be in the start of the films it's in the start of the Fantastic Beast soundtrack for the first like 10 seconds mm. and I don't know the name of the track but it's that quirky one that's used a lot throughout the films um, that's only used in the final scene of this film um, when Harry gets the firebolt and flies, flies into the clouds um, 
although I would have liked to have seen that theme crop up more in it, as I said with the tone, I'm not sure it would have fit the rest of the film. So I think he picked the place placement of that scene of that song, sorry, um, in an effective scene. Although I think the weakest part of this film is the final scene. Um, it ends on a very very awkward freeze frame of Harry in the clouds with the firebolt. Uh, which none of the other films do. They all ha- like you know end on motion and not a freeze frame. Um, but then again, I don't know how else you could have ended this movie. I do think you needed to end it on that lighter note after all the drama that had come before it. I'm not sure that was the correct scene to end it on, though. Yeah, um, there's the, the whole firebolt subplot's really frustrating in this as well because in the obviously oh god, like in the book, I should have a shot every time I say it. Um, <laughs> he gets it as a present. And it doesn't say who it's from. Very similar to the Nimbus 2001. Although the Nimbus 2001 is made clear in that first film, it's from McGonagall because he yeah. doesn't have a broomstick to play Quidditch. Oh, Nimbus 2000, you mean? That's the one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, I prefer the sleeker, better yeah. design. Um, and then in this, he just gets it at the end, and you know it's from him. They've got the feather, but in the book, there's a subplot. They weren't. They investigate it. They have to inspect. It could be like a, a plan to murder him. This, that, the other. And there's a really good Quidditch subplot which they unfortunately had to get rid of. Where Gryffindor finally win the House Cup, it does make sense to delete that delete that aspect of it because mm. it would take so much more time. But they had to obviously keep that first one in with the Dementor attack. But I mean, the way that ends with the books, it's, it's, it, it would have been so much funnier. He gets to the train station, you know, Vernon's fuming it, at the start of the book. They know about Sirius Black on the Muggle news. They just say that this murderer's escaped from this prison, mm. and then at the end of it, Harry's like. Oh, that that guy that escaped. Yeah, he's my godfather. And like the Dursleys are just terrified that there's a murder related to Harry and stuff like that. <laughs> so it, you're right. I mean, the ending, the freeze frame. I don't like it. It's weird. It's cool. The broomstick made an appearance, but there there would have been a lot softer ways to have ended this film on. Um, mm, I think I think you could have still ended it with the whole firebolt thing, but maybe just not end it on a freeze frame. Have it like the camera pan round and have him like fly into the sunset or something, or yeah. like, into the clouds, anything like that, and then fade to black, just to match the sort of endings of all the other ones. Because none of the other ones end on a freeze frame, and I actually think most it's of the ending shots to one. all the films end on a really, really beautiful note. Especially watching um, Goblet of Fire and Order of the Phoenix, they end on a really, really nice scene. Yeah, and um, this is just like his face smudged. It looks like he's actually yeah. attacked by a Dementor and. I don't know. I mean, it's such a nitpicky thing, but then again, it's the final moment. It's got to be rememberable, and it's not. Mm. And I mean, it, it does. I think what made the soundtracks and the the first two movies endings really just stand out was the leaving Hogwarts slash reunion of friends track, which isn't used in this movie at all. Um, you couldn't use it for this scene, and that's what I mean. It does feel like a departure in many respects. Then again. Um, looking at John Williams as a musician I'm sure with the amount of films there are in this series if he had to come back and keep recycling the same songs over and over and over again and not bringing anything new to the table um, that would have just like really been boring for him so I like that he did almost give us like a completely original score with this one I just wish there was slightly more of a carryover from some of the other themes just to make it, you know, better flow and just feel make it feel like a sense that it is still part of the series. Because that's one of my problems with the soundtracks, especially with these middle few films, with this one, Goblet of Fire, and even kind of Order of the Phoenix. I think Six Onwards had the same composer, didn't it? Or did Five have um, the same composer? So Five and Six had the same composer, Nicholas Hooper. He was asked to come back, but he chose not to. And then Alexander Desplat got the final yeah. two. So I I think they were trying to bridge themselves with director to carry on with it, but not director, sorry, a uh, composer, mm. and they kind of got there about to just didn't want to finish it because I really like what Nicholas Hooper did with it. Yeah, very me different too. to Williams, but with the Williams stuff, it's like Star Wars. He's done three different eras, which has ha- resulted in three very different soundtrack types. I know you're not the biggest fan of the Episode Seven one, mm. but you know it's Star Wars from the get go. Which yeah. is what differs from the Harry Potter's, but then again, it's not three eras; it's one era of seven years he's got to go through. And again, for Fantastic Beast, mm. they've gone; it's a new era, and they've gone for a very different composer. Who I, th- they'll be very lucky to have stick around for five films, I think, as well in James mm. Newton Howard. Yeah. And I mean, we could talk about the soundtracks as they evolve in the next ones when we get to our Goblet of Fire review, etc. But um, I think we should just end this thing off on some of our favourite scenes. We've already touched on a few. For example, the moment where Sirius is looking at the stars. That's one of mine. I think the Dementors' first appearance is a great moment as well. Um, Do you have any other favourite moments from this movie, this being your favourite one in the series? Um, There's quite a few. There's before he looks into the stars, just what you said, the the whole room bit with him, Snape, and... 
um, Pettigrew. I love the entirety of that. It's one of my favourite scenes of the franchise. There's the immortal turn to page 394. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love that Snape finally gets his lesson. And even some of the ones in Hogsmeade where Harry's just taking the mick out of Malfoy and stuff, they're, they're, they're quite fun and, you know, they are teenagers at the end of the day, but it's so hard with this because there, there isn't necessarily a memorable scene as much as there is in the other films, but I just love the fluidity of the entirety of this film mm. and I just I just love it. I, I think I like the whole thing it's so easy. The werewolf transformation, actually, yeah. that's one of the standouts, but then again, I see that as the sort of star scene as well. Yeah, same. Um, for me, I love the Dementors Converge. Um, that's going by the title on the soundtrack. The scene where Harry steps up and does the final Patronus charm. Uh, the music and just sort of the how the f- scene is framed, the colours in it, how you've got the white just like battering back these Dementors, this onslaught. Um, I love that scene. I think that's a beautifully crafted scene. That's definitely one of my favourites in the film. Um, basically, any scene with Lupin in, I love. The Bogart scene's really fun. Oh, yeah. Um, of course, I forgot about that. I love the Bogart I, scene. I can't remember... Um, <laughs> and we get to see Alan Rickman in drag for, <laughs> for a moment when he's in uh, Neville Longbottom's grandma's clothes. Um, I can't remember what student it is. Is it Pavati Patel? Yeah. Um, who steps up and sh- um, her biggest fear is a snake. I think it's a cobra that shows up. And you're meant to change it into something that's lighthearted, that makes you laugh. She changes it into the most terrifying thing I think I've ever seen in any of these films, which is like this demonic jack-in-the-box thing. I'm like, I'd rather take the snake in, in all honesty. Like, this thing's terrifying. Um, so I love all those scenes. If I'm going to go with least favourite scene, other than the ending shot, it's the night bus. I hate this scene so much. And I love the scene in the book. I love how she describes it in the book. You get a real sense of like the interior and how this thing works. Lenny Henry's shrunken head character, I know you mentioned earlier that you liked it, is like a Jar Jar Binks character to me in this film. I hate it so much and thankfully the night bus scene is relatively short in the movie. I like some of the filming mechanics they use. They use a lot of slow-mo cameras. I think they had the night bus um, traveling at regular speed and they had all the other traffic on the road um, driving at a snail's pace and they worked it that way. Um, It's just a really, really annoying, irritating scene to me, which is a shame considering it is one of my favorite bits in the book. Um, Other than that, there's really not a lot of scenes I dislike. Um, and that's where, like, if I'm going to give my recommendation on this film, it's kind of awkward because I don't hate this film by any stretch of the imagination. There are some great scenes as we've gone through. Um, the performances are fantastic, especially with uh, David Thewlis, um, Gary Oldman, and even Timothy Small as well as Wormtail. Um, all of those people work off each other really well. There's some really nice soundtrack moments. However, it doesn't quite hit the heights or the immersion for me as the first two did especially Chamber of Secrets, which I still regard as probably one of my favourites. Um, and I don't hold it up there as one of the best in the series. I think, for example, Order of the Phoenix is a lot better than this. I would even go so far as to say that <sighs> Goblet of Fire might even be better than this one, although I think this one flows better and definitely has the best performances probably out of all the films, aside from Chamber of Secrets. So I don't know. It's a weird... Th- that's how I feel when I watch it. It makes me feel weird. It makes me feel uncomfortable when I watch it. Um, It's definitely not one of my favourites, but it is... I would say it is an iconic one in the series for what it did for the rest of the franchise and sort of like the aesthetic look that it did that did bleed over into all the other ones to continue to finish off the franchise. Yeah. um, Mine's very different in that it's it's my favourite one of the series. I think it's the the best made. Not necessarily the most memorable. That goes to part two for very obvious reasons, but... (laughs) I think everything they introduce and the, the story they tell and manage to wrap it up so well, um, I love it. And I, I want to see more of Koran in Harry Potter. It would have been fascinating to see what he could have done, but it's just one of those where it was it was the right age of the cast mixed with the right story for the right timing. Mm. Before everything went completely dark, there was still this story. Yeah, and I'm not sure why he didn't come back for the future ones. I'll have to read up on he, that when we get to our Goblet of Fire review. But I think he, he, he was in pre-production for... Um, Children of Men. Oh, right. So he was meant to do that first, and then he says, okay, I'll do Harry Potter, but he then went straight back for Children of Men, so I assume he just was probably a passion project more than a franchise, mm. which is fair enough. Yeah, that's fair enough. And I mean, we would kind of like to see more of Kron, because he hasn't really done anything since Gravity, I don't think. And no, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't the biggest fan of that movie, but visually it was absolutely stunning, so... I think he's very specific on what he likes to do, which is mm. 
credit credit for that rather than being shoehorned in to do five films in ten years. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've pretty much said everything I can on Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. If you have, we'll um, we'll yep. round it off. Okay, so that'll do it for our review on Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Be sure to comment, subscribe, let us know what you think of this movie or anything related to Harry Potter. Please do drop us a comment. We'll be sure to get back to your comment as quick as we can. Um, This being Harry Potter Month, we want to bring as many Potter fans in as possible. Our next review, I think, will be Goblet of Fire. I know we've been deciding that you're going to do a video of your favourite Harry Potter moments. Uh, Whether that will be released in between this or Goblet of Fire, we're unsure, but we will have reviews on all the rest of the movies as well as some other little surprise videos along the way. So please do hit that subscribe button. As well as Harry Potter Month, we'll be bringing you more reaction videos. There'll be movie reviews to other films coming out this month like Arrival, which I'm really looking forward to. I'm seeing that later this week. Um, So yeah, so just stick around with the channel. And until the next video, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening. Mischief managed.